goal for this panel is we've, we've heard a lot from uh, folks, both some engineers and some lawyers, about where we've been in the past and what we can do to reform the FTC going forward. But what we're trying to do with this uh, group of uh, luminaries is actually to provide some insights into what the technology is doing, what are the technology constraints. We've heard about the institutional constraints and the commercial constraints. So where is the technology going to take us? Um, so the way we're going to run this panel is that um, each of the panelists will ask a couple of questions. They'll make a few opening comments. Then we'll move into discussion uh, on the panel. And then hopefully we'll have time for uh, conversation from the audience as well. And so I'll just um, introduce them briefly as we've done. Uh, you can read the uh, bios in the booklet. Um, so first we've got uh, Doug Sicker, who's the uh, DBC and Dell Professor of the uh, Computer Science and Interdisciplinary Telecommunications Program at the University of Colorado. Um, and um, there's something of a pattern here at this table. He, among other many things, uh, was in fact CTO of both the FCC and the NTIA. Um, <clears throat> next we have Dale. It must be the, uh, the Colorado Air, I think. Um, Dale is a senior fellow at Silicon Valley Center and an adjunct professor at the University of Colorado. Um, Dale, I think, I, I may get the sequence wrong, but he started the chief of the Office of um, Planning and Policy, Planning and Policy at the FCC, uh, with the NTIA, ended up as chief of the OGT and uh, chief technologist at the FCC. Uh, then we have uh, Ed Tiedemann, who's a senior vice president of engineering at Qualcomm. He's also a Qualcomm fellow, and uh, he leads the uh, organization's uh, worldwide standards efforts, among other things. Um, design engineer by background. Uh, then we have uh, Preston Marshall, uh, who's uh, a research professor at the Kentucky School of Engineering at the University of Southern California. He's also uh, the division director of um, the uh, Information Science Institute, ISI, uh, at uh, USC. And uh, what I tried to do in um, getting us into conversation quickly, I, I discouraged uh, people from having slides, but one of the things that, that, that uh, Preston has done is he's been a program manager at DARPA, and program managers at DARPA get their way. And you will see that there is one person who will actually have slides. But program managers at DARPA do slides very quickly. And it's, it's worth waiting for it. It's a good set of slides, I saw. Um, and uh, at the end of the panel, we've got uh, Milan Gudikov, who's a distinguished member of technical staff at uh, Arctel Gusum. Uh, he's one of the leading researchers uh, in this field. He's, worked, he's currently working on uh, dynamic spectrum access, he's working on green wireless, and also working on network virtualization. So what I'd like to do is to just get going, get, get uh, the panelists to sort of seed their ideas. And I'll start with Doug, who's recently come back from being at the FCC and NTA, and who can actually now um, answer the question of, hey Doug, you know, what can you now talk about that you couldn't talk about? <laughs> Almost not. Actually, what I wanted to what I wanted to talk about was uh, kind of give a, a three-year snapshot of uh, of my some of my experiences. And uh, in about 2009, right before I uh, joined the National Broadband Plan, I was talking to Paul Colazzi, and he uh, he asked very cynically, "Do you think anything will ever change?" And then I went on to uh, work on many parts of the plan, including the Spectrum uh, chapter, and that had fairly comprehensive reform. There were things about transparency with the dashboard. There were things about incentive auctions, unlicensed, uh, un uh, opportunistic use. A lot of things were in there. Some of them have uh, uh, been developed more than others, but uh, a lot of change. And uh, certainly it was a set of recommendations and roadmaps. And then um, uh, just two years ago, a year and a half ago, Preston actually asked me, he said, uh, he said I think uh, policy in the spectrum space is stagnating. Do you think anything will change? And that was right before we started working on the PCAST report. And I think that report, as, as you all are probably aware, has brought a lot of new ideas. And uh, really has brought back this idea of sharing. And I think uh, sharing in many different ways. And two other things, of course, that came along. Uh, one was light squared, uh, which brought back to the forefront the idea of receiver <coughs> standards, uh, which we just, uh, Pierre and a bunch of us just held, held a meeting this morning on. And the other was uh, the 1755 to 1780. 1755 to 1850 um, <laughs> report. It's how you tell it. Uh, uh, I'm an engineer. The, uh, 
and the funny thing is, is on 1755, everyone thinks of that as a spectrum sharing uh, <coughs> effort, and it really wasn't. It was about tolerance, and it was about this idea of coexistence of, of, of different services. And I'm really pleased to see how that's developing, and I think it's much better than the report I was given when I first walked into NTIA over a year ago, where it said, you know, 10 years, $18 billion, oh, and you have to move us into broadcast spectrum. Yeah, that's going to happen. So, uh, you know, I, I think this idea of 1755 to 1850 band as a, as a perfect opportunity for looking at coexistence modeling, um, it, it's right there. And I know that uh, uh, Preston's going to pick up on that, so I'll leave, it, I'll leave that to, to him. But all of these things I talked about are really just spectrum tools, whether it's reallocation, whether it's sharing, whatever it might be. And they're all, they all have their place, but they are, are not in and of themselves something that we should be pushing or driving as an agenda. They only, they, only make, they only make sense as to when they're rational in the market or when they're rational from a, a policy perspective. And you know, I, I keep thinking in the near term, we need to keep it simple. We should clear spectrum when we can clear it. We should use tolerance modeling, coexistence modeling when we can. And we should be looking at more unlicensed. And whether that's unlicensed in a, in a, in a contiguous band or whether that's through TV white space is, is, a, is something that could be debated. But we know contiguous unlicensed spectrum is, is, is really great. And if we can get more of that, I think we'd be in a better position. Um, in the long term, though, we have to be patient and recognize that all of these tools will have some impact as time goes on. We think about uh, uh, you know, the, the Part 15 rule <coughs> as happening overnight, but they didn't. They took a long, long time to actually pan out. So Wi-Fi didn't happen overnight. It took, it took literally years and years. And I think that uh, willingness to stick to it over the long term is, is another very important thing. I'm going to skip some of my other notes because I think uh is going to kick me. Um, here's one thing I, I will stick my neck out and say. Um, I think that we need a better sense of leadership because we have these two agencies that are at, often at odds, NTIA and SEC. And I think this is where the White House uh, really needs to step up. I don't believe that these two agencies necessarily have to merge. But I think a stronger, clearer message from the White House as to what we're doing and how we're going to move forward so that it's agreed upon at the commission, it's agreed upon at NTIA and, and DOD uh, would uh, go a long way. I'm, I'm not from this town, so could you just help me understand what would the White House actually have to say? Actually, that's the one to thing that's interesting. Uh, to, well, to the appointees. Yeah, we're strong. Uh, Tom, and, Tom and I've had this conversation many times. It has to go. It has to. It has to do with this. Um, there's many levels of, uh, of uh, government, and you know, with the president at the top and all of his appointees, and then you have the mass of the of the of the uh, civil servants, and those appointees have to get a, me a direct message from above saying, "We are going to do this. We are going to make this happen," and that has to trickle down. And sometimes it doesn't trickle down. And I can see, I've seen that on, on you know, search for 500 megahertz. So we'll turn to Dale, who's actually perhaps in the best position uh, to be asked the impossible question, which is, Dale, we've seen a lot of this happen over the years. Where do you think we're going? Well, I think I'm probably uh, misplaced here uh, uh, on the panel, but I probably would have been better placed on the historical panel. Because, uh, you know, I'm not at the stage of my career where I'm doing much in many anymore, so I can really foresee uh, uh, see the future. I, mean, I think we can all sort of extrapolate from the uh, from where we are today. We need to solve the, the, the crunch. We need to get more bits per second per hertz, more efficiency. We need things, more compression. Uh, we need to continue to try to move higher in frequency to uh, take the uh, pressure off some of the lower spectrum. Uh, picking up on Doug, we need to do more sharing, dynamic sharing, getting uh, people uh, uh, tired together in smaller cells, which I think critical. And uh, all these other things with regarding the actual management in terms of centralized versus decentralized approaches and so forth. So, uh, you know, I, I can sort of see that, but that's just extrapolating today and trying to invent, uh, you know, trying to foresee something. I remember just happened to be having a discussion with some someone when somebody first uh, proposed DSL 
talked about DSL, but it, it just, you know, that, might have, that was not my model. That twisted pair of wire wasn't going to be able to carry anything in terms of bandwidth. And, uh, you know, some very smart people figured out a way that they could actually do it. And that's the sort of thing that what we're talking, I wish I, I wish I had a crystal ball that I could forecast uh, uh, that sort of thing, and I, I can't. But so what I thought I would do, uh, uh, well, I thought, take just a moment and sort of go back in uh, my career. And one of my major concerns here, and some of you have heard me say this before, is I'm worried about this uh, sort of interference, aggregation, the uh, what I've called here in my notes a death by a thousand cuts. Uh, let, let me just briefly say the situation when I began my career five decades ago. Uh, Peter, I was actually, I think, around that 66 report uh, that he talked to, talked about, the silent crisis. Uh, let me just very quickly, Mike, for five, five days, we had limited modulation formats. You didn't have to deal with lots of different uh, types of signals. Uh, there were, everybody was on you know, a single or a very limited number of narrowband, typically narrowband channels. There were static uh, uh, assignment techniques that transmitters generally were high power, high antenna sites, especially in the mobile area. The systems were noise limited. We licensed stations, we licensed the trainers. Transfers, remember back, uh, we also licensed operators and technicians. And uh, it's sort of interesting to me because some of these things that we worry about in a more dynamic future is somebody misconfiguring something and causing interference, perhaps even deliberately. So maybe licensing operators, <coughs> something we consider today. We had unique identifiers called call letters. Now, now today, of course, we don't equip the certification. And of course, the signals were often clear and easily decipherable. So if I was, my ham radio was getting into the TV set next door, you could generally figure out that you could, well, they did. The neighbors figured out the culprit was, uh, was me. <laughs> 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 but the situation is so, uh, so different going forward. Virtually unlimited modulation formats, waveforms, multiple broadband channels scattered over a wide range, dynamic rather than static access, low power, low antenna heights, interference limited systems, uh, increase in unlicensed and licensed by rule transmitters. We didn't have near as much then. Minimal licensing of operators and, and uh, technicians. Limited use of unique identifiers, in other words, no call letters. Signals are off or encrypted or not easily decipherable. We have underlay networks now, and uh, some of the stuff I've been reading kind of, kind of commission uh, recently, uh, we knew how to worry about the GPS spectrum, but now jammers, you know, the deposit the jammers, and you know, all kinds of, not that it wasn't jammers back in the old days, but this, it's a different level of impact. And of course we have continued unintentional radiators and, 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 and so forth. And, and what the implication of this is, what I'm trying to do is say, okay, uh, what do we what do we need to invent, sort of in the technology space, to uh, to overcome these sort of problems? And, and quite frankly, uh, quite frankly, I'm 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 not I'm not uh, I'm not sure. Uh, the uh, uh, you take uh, there's some technical people who do a much better job. You can take two broadband signals to worry about in the intermod. What do you get? You get a broadband intermod signal. It's very noiseless. And now one goes about trying to figure out what the source of the interference is in a situation like that. It tends to increase the background noise, I guess is what I'm saying. And those things sort of worry me. And of course, if you have an awful lot of that going on, then we worry about, I think Chuck Jackson uh, touched on it, uh, is, uh, is uh, an increase in the background noise and how we go about uh, abatement and so forth. And that is, is pr pretty, uh, pretty tough. So to summarize then, uh, concerned about a very dynamic spectrum sharing environment coupled with receiver inadequacies, dear to my heart, a vastly increased numbers of transmitters in close proximity, interference from unintended radiators, all the switching power supplies out there and so forth, and then intentional interference. Uh, we've got uh, some real challenges, uh, uh, real challenges facing, and that's where I come and agree really with Peter Tenpula, who has made the important point, I think, of how important enforcement is. Enforcement at the commission, I think, generally speaking, has not, re not received the policy attention that it's deserved in the past, and I think it's probably even more important going forward as we adopt some of these advanced uh, techniques. Uh, let me uh, uh, just add one thing here, and this is my stump speech, you know, sort of thing. Uh, 
about incentives. When I look at all this, it all comes down to incentives. I, I sat here and listened to this, all this wonderful technology, all these sort of things and sharing that we can do. And you know, it's all great, but the incentives have to be there. And we talked about, you know, DOD, does DOD really have the incentive to want to share? And probably not, probably not. Do receiver manufacturers <coughs> want to tighten up their receiver selectivity that may benefit other people to allow other people to uh, jam more people in? Well, in their own band, there's incentives, but does that exist outside? No. So a lot of this comes down to incentives. And then what my final thing is, if we're going to innovate, we've got to talk about not only innovation, of course, in the technology sense, but we need to innovate in the, in the policy uh, in the policy space to be able to uh, uh, be able to accommodate some of these uh, technologies that I'm sure my fellow panelists will, will talk more about. Thank you, Dale. We'll turn to uh, Ed, who helps uh, operators think about you know, all sorts of problems, and traffic is one of them. So, you know, we all really heard about exploding traffic demand. What, what's, what's making that happen? Okay, well, first I'd like to thank Dale for this great uh, little thing talking about uh, getting ham radio systems out of. Uh, Wi-Fi systems, one of my first things that I did about 40 something years ago was to get a ham radio system out of a public radio station. <laughs> so it wasn't being rebroadcast. Okay, but let me get back to this. You know, it's about 20 years ago when we were sort of doing the development of CDMA and actually getting into standards, we started really starting to think about data. And I remember my first data card was this, what we call data on the go, plugged in, Got about eight kilobits per second. Okay. Well, no, no, it, was, it was a major improvement over data over analog cellular, which was pretty much hopeless. Um, but it took a long time for things to happen. And today, let's look at where we are. Today, we're growing, we're doubling roughly year to year on the amount of data load on our mobile, mobile cellular networks. The latest CTI figures are showing 633 billion megabytes over a six month period. To make this a little more understandable, that's about 11 megabytes per day for every person in this country. 2016 is 200 megabytes per day for every person in this country. It's phenomenal. Okay. And that's what's driving us. And of course, where is it coming from? Well, we've already, somebody else earlier mentioned, yeah, video. That's where the real growth is going to be a number of bits. But we really also need to look at, talk using another the analogy, death by a thousand cuts. There's another death by a thousand cuts. And that's all the little apps that sit on this phone. Okay, they all want a dialogue with the cloud or some server out there, checking, gee, is there another message for me? you know, another tweet, all of these things, just take it, and that's what kills the battery. A lot of our battery life on these phones is just dead by a thousand, I'll call it microtransactions, okay, to put it in that perspective of it. But we're talking about the huge expansion. So what can we do about it? Okay, and this is one of the real things. Well, we talked about video. Well, we're in the process of just completing H.265. Um, that's high efficiency video codec standard. That's going to be a major advancement. But wait a second, it's only going to do a factor of two more efficiency. That's what we've been able to do in video coding over about 10 years. And that's for roughly the same quality. On the other hand, you have to remember that we went from small screens here with lousy video to now with a really high quality video. I mean, we're talking about 4K video on tablets believe it or not, and things like that. Hey guys, you know, the bit explosion is going the other way. H.265 is only going to be a very, very, very small dent in that whole thing. So, what do we do other things? You know, we basically say, gee, people talk about MIMO and all of that. Well, how many antennas can I actually put on a little phone like this? Not many, maybe two and now as we're going up in numbers of bands, and I'll get into that in a minute, I can't get that much, okay, on, you know, in terms of antennas. So maybe two, so we get two by two MIMO or four by two MIMO or something like that. 
So, what else can I do? Well, somebody says, oh, great new technologies and all of that. Well, if I look at Shannon's limits, I'm not very far from it. Okay, we've been, for the last 20 years, you know, we've been really pushing that really down. Okay, and whether it's WCDMA, HSPA, or LTE, all these systems are really using now the same techniques and tricks and the best tricks that we have. And you look at the fundamental limits, we're not that far apart in bits per second for hertz. So now we gotta look at the next dimension, space, bits per second for hertz per square kilometer per square mile here in this country. So this means more cell sites. Well, more cell sites are a problem. <coughs> Towers are a problem. Zoning problems all over the place. You say that. So there's another way to go, which are little cells, like this. This is a cell. Okay? There's an Ethernet connector. You could either you could put this as an Ethon or fiber connector, plug into a wall board. Okay. It's HSPA or CDMA 2000, this one with LTE and it's the same size. So this is what we can do. These are basically similar type technology approaches as one does in a cell phone. The neat thing about these is they can be put pretty much anywhere. Okay? And so our view and view is that we just need to get these out okay, as part of the solution. They're not the total solution, but that's more spectrum. There's no argument on that. But the point is, these go a long way. However, there's a crux to this. We have to have the backhaul. Okay, and that's where the real issue is going to be, is getting the backhaul. So, why do we want small cells? There's a capacity issue we've been talking about. There's also a coverage issue. You want to go up in data. All of our networks, for the most part, today are laid out for lower data rates, not the data rates that we want on the uplink, that is from your handset or your tablet to the cell cell. So we want to get up the data rates. We need more small cells. Let me talk a little about what one other challenge that we're being faced from a technology perspective, which is the death by the thousand bands problem. Right now we defined in 3GPP 37 bands per LTE. Okay, 37 of them worldwide. There's a big difference from the five bands that used to work for except for parts of Korea the rest of the band for, for, for basically 3G. Not only that, we're working on 28 what we call carrier aggregation. These are inter-band combinations. Where you want the carriers, because they can't get enough bandwidth to meet the data rates in one band, they want to run multiple bands simultaneously. Terrible problem for the device. Okay, in terms of intermod problems and all of that. And then there's five, eight of them where they want to work inside the same band because the allocation of band is a little screwed. So, huge amounts of things going on there. Huge amount of innovation happening in the cellular industry. Since we did the first release of WCDMA, at least what's called Release 99 back in 1999, um, we've now had essentially eight, actually nine releases uh, of 3GPP specs, basically in the last roughly 13 and a half years. So there's a huge amount because of volume in the market and everything is really going on so good. I probably said enough here. We can talk about spectrum sort of like ASA or, or something during should the discussion. We should talk about ASA, but we'll circle back to that. So, so. Um, you didn't embarrass me on the slides. I was a government employee. Was telling so, so three, three drivers, I think, for future technology. One, we're going to do spectrum sharing, whether you like the gas report or some other framework. There's a gigahertz spectrum available to share. We're fighting over 15 megahertz, 1755. This is inevitable. What we call it, how it gets branded, it's going to happen. And second, we're going to have to... Second, I'm really needed. Um, Right now we have domain managers that manage mostly homogeneous systems. A carrier, uh, NTIA is a domain manager. We have to move to where they become heterogeneous, where they don't have a single value system to impose on them. And that's going to be our second challenge. And three, because someone has to go our sacred cows, we don't have a spectrum crunch. We have an infrastructure crunch. 
Cellular capacity comes from infrastructure. We want a thousand times more capacity, doubling spectrum gets you twice as much if you just replicate the infrastructure. To get to a thousand times more capacity, we essentially need a thousand times more exosomes. Whether they be Wi-Fi, with a good backhaul, or they be LTE seconders, we are talking about spectrum policies that promote deploying extensive infrastructure. An LTE site has about 100 megahertz sector. A Wi-Fi has about 100 megahertz. You need to put those that many more of those out. If you want 100 times more capacity, you need 100 times more of those. You don't necessarily need to need more spectrum. More spectrum certainly helps, and, I, and I'm sorry sympathetic to the carriers wanting it, because it gives them a lot of flexibility. But the solution to capacity does not lie in spectrum. It lies in the flexibility to reuse it, and I just love that profit, which I'm going to steal one of these here. <laughs> we have this change. We're, we are moving from building out cellular, where we all wanted that little map to see if our house was covered, to in-building cellular to get capacity, where we want to put a thousand access points where we once had one or two. So that's the challenge. What spectrum policies allow me to deploy extensive infrastructures? Not necessarily just LTE. We've seen Wi-Fi. You know, who, 10 years ago, who would say Wi-Fi was carrying more capacity than the cellular networks? Um, but clearly, new infrastructures, new games have to come to this. So our spectrum policy shouldn't be just to shovel more spectrum into the same model that we use when we put amps out there or 3G. It is to create a model that allows us to extensively deploy infrastructures wherever we have backbone and capacity. I just, just love following this. So technology needs and implications. I think there's, there's five I came up with. First, let's... I thought this was... You still see you like myself. Uh, first one. I like Big Bird. I like you. Let's think about not having a model that clearly partitions. This is absolutely unlicensed. This is absolutely licensed. Uh, when we move into sharing, we have an opportunity to create an ecosystem. If you're an engineer, you would find it very hard to believe that the optimal system solution is perpetual licensing forever. And, and, and absolute control, and no control, and no licensing, and nothing at all. The solution lies in an ecosystem between the two. Don't know what the right answer is, you shouldn't try to predict that. But we should look to policies that create an ecosystem of licensing models that is itself enabling of more and more investment in this hundred times more infrastructure that we have to build. And it could be your light radio, too. I'll put the plug for that. Secondly, let's think right now we've developed a technology that is suited for unlicensed, or, or at least is applied in unlicensed we have LTE in the license world. Let's think that each of them has great virtues and that five or 10 years from now, they will have fused. LTE adopted TD, which, which works well in Wi-Fi. If I had a choice at home, I would much rather have my access point operating in LTE mode with QoS, authentication, um, ability to work with the PST app. So we really, we developed them because they were artifacts of policy. They weren't technologically different. And so as we remove the technology artifacts, I think we should assume that we see a convergence of the air interface between the, the, what works well in the cellular world and what works well in the unlicensed world. Three, automated coexistence. Um, if you're in the earlier meeting, if you are a venture capitalist, here is the process that Dale put up to resolve conflicts of spectrum. You go down here, you go down here, you go down here. Did you invest in something that took this policy, this many politicians? And if Google can do AdWords in 20 milliseconds, we should be thinking about coexistence not as a regulatory process going to the commission, but how do we embed it in our devices and really allocate that down? There's no way human beings can deal with the coexistence as an n squared problem. So I think Nextel was one of our first big issues. And we went almost a decade, and then M2Z led out other issues, but we didn't resolve M2Z. Almost right away, we got light squared. I would predict to you that we will see them on ever closer centers as we make more and more dense use of spectrum. So the answer is not to try to create more paths into the FCC commission. We have got to devolve this down into our systems. Four, tunable filters. I, I love that, death by a thousand bands. So for 10 years, I've tried to get people to invest in tunable filters. Bottom line, it's really difficult because there's no market for them. The military's about the only one who uses them. They buy 10, 20,000 a year. Uh, cellular companies would laugh at you. But LTE is the opportunity because what manufacturer wants to support all those permutations, right? Man on the street interview. Uh, uh, we have to move. Uh, so now there's an economic imperative.
to put tunable filters into the cellular, and the cellular is how we get cheap parts. It's how we got the cheap soft filters. It's how we'll get the tunable filters. When we move to tunable filters, not only is it enabling to solve a lot of the manufacturing problems in the cellular, it really opens up the opportunity now not to think about systems that are very, very band limited. And my last one is the holy grail, which is we spend most of our time in spectrum predicting worst case, 10 to the minus third, 10 to the minus four. Um, I looked at one of the filings on body, met, body area network, medical networks, and the only place I could find you could ever meet it was standing on two mountaintops separated by Death Valley, which I do not believe there are any hospitals. But that's how we have done spectrum management. So if we really want to get best use of our spectrum resource, there's 10 to 1,000 times more capacity if we go from predicting interference to saying, you keep operating until you hurt me. It's in LTE today, because LTE has one domain manager. But we need to take that out and think about it heterogeneously. Particularly, not just comms to comms. We always focus on that, because comms guys think about comms guys. But when we think about federal spectrum, we're primarily driven by radars. We want radars to say, I'm being interfered with. Keep going up and up to me and up to me, and then when I'm interfered with, I'll tell you and you back off. There's a massive amount of capacity there because there's no way an engineer can predict propagation. We can guesstimate it, we can give you bounds, but we can't predict it. The way to do this is to have people scream, ouch. And you know, maybe 20 years ago that was impossible because people built standalone networks. But just about no wireless network anyone thinks about today isn't connected to the internet. And so this internet backbone that's available among all these wireless products provides us an opportunity, I think, to really change our vision of interference as something we predict to interference as something that we dynamically manage. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Before we move on to Winnand, I just want to give the panelists a heads up. I'll be going down the line again to just invite you to comment on what you've heard. So now's the time to start thinking while Winnand is going to give us maybe a sense of what this all means for the architect. Yeah, I think um, the goal of my next five minutes is to try to articulate uh, what are the changes in cellular network architecture. And it doesn't necessarily have to be about cellular networking. It's any kind of wireless networking. It may evolve uh, in future that we may need to uh, introduce. So let me sort of go down to the basics and come back from there. So if you look at our existing cellular systems, they are based on uh, long-term license spectrum ownership model, where you get a spectrum license that's valid for a very <coughs> large duration for a very long time interval, and you pay lots of money for it. And by any stretch of imagination, that model has been highly successful. We have been able to deploy nationwide networks that have been providing service to millions of customers. And they are largely reliable, even though Commissioner mentioned in the morning that one out of every four base station in New Jersey was done, but at least the 75% of the base stations were still on, when the rest of the other utilities, for example, were completely down, and I live in New Jersey, surprisingly and fortunately, Verizon Wireless Service was impeccably up and running for me when everything else was not working. And that, that sliver of connectivity ensured that I could get the information that I needed uh, as and when I needed it. So going forward, in some sense, the cellular model needs to be uh, sustained, preserved, held. It doesn't need to, it will then definitely evolve over time and the evolution will be slow. So if I have to step back a little bit and look at it from the operator standpoint, if I'm Verizon, if I'm T-Mobile, if I'm Sprint, what we are experiencing is a tremendous growth in traffic, anywhere from 25 to 30 percent traffic growth in the next five years. And the only way you can cope with that traffic increase is to add more capacity to the mix in, in your network. And unfortunately, that comes with a certain cost uh, that the operator has to incur. Uh, and unfortunately, the, in, the average revenue per user is not increasing as dramatically. So you have a uh, tension between your uh, investments required to increase capacity versus expected revenue stream that you can generate. So in some sense, whatever assets you have, you have to squeeze more and more capacity out of it. So you are given an orange, and your job is to squeeze more and more juice out of it. Yesterday you may be pressing it with the hand, tomorrow you're going to use a handheld squeezer, and the next day you're going to get an electrical squeezer, right? But that squeezing, unfortunately, reaches a limit. And let me give you a spectrum-specific explanation. 
So if you are given X megahertz spectrum, you can increase your bits per second per efficiency. And also you can increase your area spectral efficiency, bits per second per meter squared. So <coughs> that's already happening. You're going to LTE and LTE advance in the long run. That's going to increase your bits per second per hertz. They're also resorting the small cells that my colleague from Polycom pointed out. Uh, so in some sense, those are the tools that you have uh, in, in your uh, tool chest. But at the end of the day, when you don't have any spectrum, new spectrum available, you're going to use the same spectrum that is in your macro cell, also in your small cells. And that leads to significant interference interactions. And the challenge that poses is that in the long run, the denser and denser deployments lead to loss of efficiency. You could lead to higher cost, lesser gains. So at the end of the day, if you want more juice, you need to buy more oranges. Similarly, you need to buy more spectrum. And first order of business is to continue to find ways of reallocating new spectrum for operating use. But in absence of huge amounts of spectrum available in the old licensing model, you need to ask a question. Is there a way to modify the cellular architecture to successfully exploit what we call as statistically available spectrum? essentially spectrum that needs to be shared in space, time, and other dimensions. Uh, and we have been looking at that question, and the answer may be tantalizingly yes. So if you have to use statistically available spectrum to improve cellular networks, what are the modifications you need to do to your cellular architecture? And uh, we believe that, first of all, the model that we need to look at is control share or lightweight con uh, control sharing as we call it, or coordinated sharing. <coughs> and implement that sharing option first of all in small cells. Uh, uh, and I think control sharing can bring you a lot of advantages even from the primary standpoint. If you have a primary band that is federally owned and it's a sensitive use, often sharing, effective sharing requires certain trust to be established between a primary and a secondary. So such trust establishment could be possible if you are resorting to a coordinated sharing model. Instead of a purely unlicensed model or a purely licensed model, we are looking at an intermediate model which is more of a lightly controlled uh, shared model. The natural question to ask is who should be implementing that share? Uh, in a technology sense, we don't need to answer that question. But from a business sense, we need to answer that question as in, the entity that coordinates the sharing, does it need to be deployed by an operator? Does it need to be deployed by, for lack of an easier example, Google? Or should, should it be run by a government? But my contention is that over time, uh, once the, the business incentives are in place, uh, the technology is proven, those questions will probably be self-answered. Uh, and Uh, last but not the least, uh, increasingly uh, what you need at the policy level is an innovation that I call formation of a policy operating system. Much like in a computer <coughs> system, your operating system is giving you control to underlying hardware for all the applications that run in the computer. Much the same way various networks or various applications that are trying to access wireless spectrum need to have a policy OS that is just the right amount rather than uh, inordinate amount of control. So finding the right amount of control and automating it as uh, Preston was also pointing, machine-driven uh, policy and enforcement is kind of the next technology innovation that needs to happen. So let me pause at this point. Great, thank you very much. Let's start this one again. So um, one of the things that, uh, that the, the unfortunate thing is I think we're all going to be in complete agreement here. There's not going to be any, any argument. This is not fun. Come on, Preston. Um, so, uh, you, you know, you earlier say something wrong. <laughs> it's inevitable. Um, so earlier today, and, and for years now, I've been hearing people say, "Oh, cognitive radio is not going to happen." And it's, and, you know, software-defined uh, radio. Uh, you know, that's overhyped. <clears throat> that's simply not true. And here's why: we already are seeing, and we continue to see, uh, the 3GPP community integrate all of these technologies, whether it's self-organized network, whether it's carrier aggregation, whatever it might be, smaller cell, all these things that the research community has been looking at for the last two decades into the standards. And that just keeps continuing. And we're seeing more and more of this, and we're only going to see more. Now, the Preston brought up, brought up a very important point, which is it's one thing to do it within uh, a contained environment. 
within a network, a carrier's network. It's something very different to do it between networks. And that's going to be where we'll start seeing that uh, kind of uh, filling the void between a pure license and pure unlicensed. Um, and I think that's where we're going to start seeing uh, some innovations in terms of uh, potential policy. And I would love to see us as, as a technical policy community to think more about that. What can we do to encourage uh, better utilization of the, of the spectrum uh, through whether it's something like uh, interference limits that Pierre is working on, uh, whether it has to do with next generation IEEE standards, which again uh, adopt a lot of new and innovative ways of exploiting the uh, spectrum space, or if it's uh, kind of taking LTV 10, version 10, and putting it into a, <coughs> converting it into a heterogeneous uh, model. I think all of these things start really breeding a much better uh, spectral efficiency as, as you really start thinking about it across the band. I just had uh, two uh, reactions, and uh, both relating, I think, to uh, uh, Preston. Uh, this uh, notion, this this notion of uh, you know doing things, increase the power to encourage me, uh, it implies, I think, that the device has is a fairly sophisticated device. You said it has to be connected. But, but I think all, I, I don't see how that, how that model works in what I would call the traditional unlicensed space, where it's permissionless, where it's, you know, we call it permission, permissionless innovation. In other words, if I have to go through figuring out how I'm going to talk back to somebody else to find out so forth, I mean, that, that really constrains the type of products that I can have. How do we handle baby monitors, for example? In, in that environment, does a baby monitor have to wake up and say, uh, uh, "Don't, don't transmit anymore"? Well, it, it, well, but because it, it requires building into that device I, connectivity, that some devices may, may raise the cost of that device significantly. Right. So, no, 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 no I, I'm trying to be cooperative. So, yes. Um, but the fact is that the baby monitor I want now isn't the old-fashioned analog between two rooms. I want it to grab my Wi-Fi network and put its stuff over there and disconnect and connect at the other end anyway, like my VCR, or my replacement for the VCR, which is my DVD, which goes on the internet. So I used to think unlicensed meant simple, but then you take a look at 802.11n and AC, and very clearly, with a sufficient number of parts, complexity is irrelevant. Just, you just have to accept that if I'm going to make enough parts, I can make it as complex as I want in terms of protocols and such. And, what's, and the benefit here is you're getting spectrum at much less cost. We now create a trade space we've never created before, which is if you accept some dependence on a network, you get the opportunity to make use of spectrum through things like TV white space databases, the kind of extended TV white space there was in PCAST. So, we allow an ecosystem to exist that says I ask no permissions, I spent $30 billion, whatever the number was, $50 billion, and I bought the spectrum free and clear, I do whatever they want. And I have at the other end where I accept certain responsibilities to the community, but I'm getting my spectrum at much lower cost. It may be even exclusive use of it, and that cost. There's a whole range in there. Experience says complexity becomes less of a burden with time and, and inexpensive in bulk media. Um, and again, I keep thinking of Google AdWords, because Eric came and lectured us during PCAST. But, you know, I mean, there's incredible complexity. They run a mini auction with thousands of advertisers, with words, with history, with demographics, and get an answer within 20 milliseconds before you know it. Um, so I, I think we should open the space and say what we really want to do is give people the right to innovate along this whole line, and then be truly market-driven, and let's see which ones work. So let's uh, go back to Ed. You had a comments. One of the things you didn't get to talk about is ASA, uh, which is something that I think we've heard about from them as well, which is yeah. these converging, sharing network. Sure. But let, before I do that, I'd like to make a couple of comments. Oops. There we go. Before I get to that, I'd like to make a couple of comments, though, on the LT versus Wi-Fi and then converging. I think there is, these are two very different animals. I think we need to think about that. Clearly, the cellular operators and users and all were clearly using both of them online. 
And there's going to be more and more integration at certain levels in the, of Wi-Fi with the cellular network. There's major projects starting with 3 gpp There's been stuff going on, but even more so happening. But the point is, <coughs> the cellular network is very much a managed, operator-centric network. Okay, and as a result of that, it can get very, very <coughs> high efficiencies. Okay, bits per second per hertz per square kilometer. Okay, to use that term. Um, because of that, and we spend a lot of effort in terms of technology and all of that, doing that very tight management. Wi-Fi network is totally different. It's sort of thrown up as is. Now, the same network is going to get better, but there's still much more of the control, traditionally, of the user, the homeowner, okay, the enterprise, and all of that. And that's, I think, one of the big differences. There. And so there's a certain class, in my, <clears throat> my view, of traffic that really works well over Wi-Fi, i.e. stuff running around my home, okay, or my office, and then there's stuff that really works well on cellular, okay, and I think we need to think about that. And maybe at some point they'll merge, but I don't see that right now in the same sense, other than the use of Wi-Fi in a, in a hot spot type environment for cellular See, I think you just gave all the reasons why the carriers should want to bring the management, so for example, you brought your friend, well, management, but just take a look. Look, just, how many just, people, just quick, yeah. look how many carriers are rolling out Wi-Fi networks. Why would you want to accept that I roll out a Wi-Fi network and it's total anarchy, and I roll out an LTE femtocell network and it's totally controlled? Because you have only zero or one. Yeah. So either license or unlicensed, you have nothing in between that can uh, allow you to have a better access than Wi-Fi. And it's our job to potentially create that reality. So in absence of any other reality, I had to go to Wi-Fi as my last uh, reading option, right? But not as what you would desire 10 years out. Uh, mother, need right. is the mother of invention. So yes. I think uh, if I need, today I need to use Wi-Fi, I will use Wi-Fi. If there's a better option, and if I create that better option, uh, I'm sure there are willing uses for that uh, uh, alternate universe, uh, is how I would put it. Now, one of the things you talked about in another conversation we had was where you start with a network where it's very loosely controlled. So we, we have this conversation, and actually Ed was just mentioning it. So there's very loose control, and then over time, as, as traffic goes up, as interference goes up, you want to put more control on it. Absolutely. Can you just explain it, how that works and for who? Is that in a piece of exclusive license spectrum, or can you actually transition from something that is normally unlicensed? So it's a, it's a model where you're kind of relaxing the, uh, the existing license model, but at the same time you are constraining the unlicensed model and trying to bring them together. So in the existing license model, you own the spectrum, you are the only player. It's like my backyard in the house. I'm the only one can go and use it. The unlicensed model is like public park. My kid and 100 other kids can come and play at the same time. There is no real control I can enforce, right? But is there an overseeing entity that I can put in? Essentially, a, 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 a control entity that sits at the entrance of the park and says, I'm going to allow only 100 people on Sunday because that's what my park can support. And uh, I'm basically, spatially, temporally, and uh, in other dimensions, monitor the system and start exercising more control if need be. Uh, 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 so uh, that control entity is the one essentially dynamically moving the pendulum, if you want to call it so. Uh, now, essentially what you're doing is you're moving the complexity from uh, uh, within the network into somewhat of a centralized uh, entity where the reporting of network dynamics is being shared and that decisions are being made, right? Uh, so that's an architectural change that you're putting into your uh, network. Unlike the existing cellular system, or, uh, which has fully centralized control and fully centralized data as well, uh, where unlicensed, there's a fully distributed control. Can you reduce the control on the cellular side and add a little bit more, <coughs> less chaos in the unlicensed to bring you more sedate realities uh, the area? So, so my question is, what do you do with the people you don't live in the park? Unfortunately, we have country club and we have <coughs> public park. So I think it's sort of, uh, uh, there's, there's a uh, sure fairness uh, access issue, uh, but all things exist in life, I think. You have your own backyard, you have public park, and you have a country club. So I think uh, based on the quality of experience you're willing to pick, uh, you exercise a different type of control, which is what I'm saying. So it doesn't have to be a
control architecture that transcends all bands. It could be band-specific architecture. Well, one of the, I mean, this reminds me of a proposal that many people have made, Tom Hedger comes to mind, where he says, um, you know, if you guys, you know, over on the West Coast are so, uh, so gung ho about a license, why don't you just buy some spectrum at auction? Buy, buy yourself some land, build yourself a park, and sit at the gate and control if you need to the number of people that goes in there. But that database begins to sound like exactly what Verizon and AT&T and those guys do. So is there a, is there a trouble? What is the middle point between these two models? So, so why do we have to pick a middle point? But we should create the ecosystem and let the market decide the middle point. We should commit, though, to creating alternatives between the two extremes. So what, 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 what fund the ecosystem needs to be created? So, like the PCAS report proposed that people could buy spectrum for short periods of time. Basically, you could buy spectrum for the equivalent time as the amortization of the equipment. So this is a three-year piece of equipment. I'm going to throw it out. I might be able to want to be in that business in three years. So I could get spectrum for three years. And I might have been subject to constraints, and I could create the kind of comments that today are really uneconomical to go out and say, I'm going to buy it for essentially perpetuity. Um, so I think that's the kind of experimentation. We, we experiment with technology, but we haven't really created the opportunity to experiment with licensing models. So what, one, one more comment. 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 We've got a couple of comments, and what I'd like to do, let me just cue something up while you guys are thinking. Um, I want to move to Q&A. We've got 15 minutes. I'd like to get some input from the audience. But since there are so many smart people with lots of good ideas, what I'm going to ask you to do, if you have a question or a comment, please come to the mic, and we'll queue up a couple of comments in a row, and then have the panel respond. So one quick comment is in, in the uh, compendium of white papers that uh, this workshop has, there's a fascinating paper that talks about traffic in Calcutta. And it kind of hits a note. Uh, I never lived in Calcutta, but I know about the traffic in Calcutta. And it makes a case that how the traffic kind of self-organizes itself, and things still move, right? But at the same time, we don't aspire to have that as the role model for organizing traffic. Um, so. Uh, we, we prefer having some structure, we prefer having some control, right? So uh, my, my contention is that the unlicensed is a little bit like, uh, or it has a potential of becoming like traffic in Calcutta, where it's essentially a tragedy of common things move, but when you need it, when it's really densely populated, when it's really uh, densely <coughs> integrated together, you may not get the best quality of it. So you need to institute some amount of structure and control. Uh, it doesn't have to be the fully licensed modular structure, but it could be something better than uh, this kind of where I'm coming from. Ed, you have a comment? Yeah, my, my first comment that's after spending some time in India, I think traffic moves quite bomb the place for the most part. <laughs> so I don't think we would ever want to uh, hold that up as uh, it's the worst Wi Fi network imaginable to be straightforward. Um, but, but one of the things that I do want to bring up. Um, is I think something that I did bring up in my white paper, which is really talking about what we call authorized shared access, or where I think there's a possibility, and I think where we can take some of the spectrum that the federal government does have and really try to reuse it in, in a much more coordinated, automated way. And this may work better for the licensed space, but it could also work for unlicensed also. Why I say licensed there is that you're dealing with maybe entities, so it's an easier negotiation or something like that with, say, a, a cellular operator or someone like that, with for a government agency or something like that, it might be a little issue. But I think we can do that, and particularly when you start looking at the small cell paradigm, I think that really becomes quite quite good, and we've been working, and, and there's also activities now, of course, happening uh, in Europe on the same thing. Uh, one of the other things uh, relative to this death by a thousand cuts of spectrum is that if we can also somehow find spectrum which is being used in other parts <coughs> of the world, but we may have a constraint because of the federal usage here, but maybe it's not a full country constraint and there's value there. And along that line, you do need to do something that's long enough that there's certainty in being able to deploy it. So my three-year throwaway equipment really does not work very well. Uh, okay. Any okay, no, 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 I just asked my question. So How many seconds. people have over a three-year-old Wi-Fi hotspot in their house? How many have replaced it every couple of years? No, I'm saying a lot of three years works for us. 50-50. So it's probably because you went from a B to an N. <laughs> no, I bought everyone in between. <laughs> Ask my wife.
Okay, so we're going to move to uh, Q&A. We've got yeah. one question there. Any other questions, please line up. Please go ahead. This question is for Don. A very wise person once told me, a spectrum is sexy, the wireline is not. Um, I think part of the problem that we, Ed alluded to, is the fact that we do have a backhaul problem. We have a special access circuit problem. And the question I have for you and for some of the other panelists is, how do we start to break down the well-known silos, both at the FCC, Department of Commerce, that is, is perpetuating this is wireless, this is wireline, this is something else. Uh, because we're not going to solve all the problems that we alluded to unless there's a slightly more holistic approach to, uh, to fixing these things. Uh, I couldn't agree more. And um, this is one of those things that uh, the National Broadband Plan tried to wrestle with, trying to think about this, you know, the hybrid networks. The idea that you, know, you have a wireline that's going to uh, wireless that's going to uh, terminate on the quickly on the fiber, and how to how to encourage uh, both of those resources, and you know, and all the other issues of backhaul that might be would be around it, and you know, I I don't know how much the silos of the of the commission impact that and perpetuate it. Uh, there is a sense of competition sometimes between the, uh, the different bureaus and offices I've seen. Um, but I think uh, you know, there is a sense that broadband is the goal, and that broadband is over wireline and wireless. Um, I don't know um, beyond thinking uh, at the chairman's level, uh, uh, or again maybe at the White House. Uh, I don't know how that breaks down either into an NTIA issue, because um, when I look at the broadband, you know, VTOP program that was looking equally at wireline and, and wireless. Uh, but was really trying to push fiber because they saw the, you know, the, the holes. And I guess that would be the thing that I would, I would argue, which is um, not allowing one to outpace the other. And you'd hope that the, the business drivers would, would, would keep up with that. Dale, you have? Uh, Good. So we have uh, two more questions. So what I suggest is if uh, you introduce yourself, ask the question, and we'll have the second question as well. And we'll turn to the panel. Uh, Matt Larson from Lisa. Um, I guess one of my things, the discussion today in a lot of spectrum, uh, it seems like mobile broadband is kind of like the toy that I used to distract my dog when I wanted to think about something else. Um, and kind of what I'm hearing in this discussion is that uh, we're getting more and more focus on small cells, and that kind of carries away from a carrier-centric focus and a little bit more towards uh, heterogeneous networks that maybe are uh, not necessarily carrier-centric, they're operated by smaller operators, almost like viral broadband deployment by many operators that would then be opened up beyond carriers to like Apple or Google or Amazon if they want to sell their own service and devices that connect over the heterogeneous network like that. Um, that's something I've really seen discussed. Can you guys provide any comment on that? Is that something you see as being a possibility? Great, so we've got a question about viral networks. TN. Yeah. Um, I'd like to hear a little more from Ed and Dylan uh, in response to that present vision of uh, LTE leading the way for to uh, a tune Great. So, uh, two questions that Jeff will. Um, coming back to Max's question, I think, but maybe I go first. Then. Yeah, yeah, I don't make sure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think uh, you're, you're absolutely right, I think. Uh, if the cost of the base station goes down, and if the backfill is rightly available, uh, it kind of empowers uh, deployment models that here before were not possible. So here before you needed to have a large spectrum uh, asset, you needed to acquire a site and you deployed a large uh, base station. Uh, so will that lead to a market disruption where in addition to the existing players, whether it will lead to emergence of more utility players that are very regional, very focused, very local. Uh, technology will definitely enable that, whether the market reality will enable that and how soon that will enable, I think I'm least uh, equipped to answer that question. But uh, I think I said the technology is concerned that deployment model and therefore that kind of a market reality can definitely emerge, I would say. So. 
So, so Matt, I think if you take my view that wireless capacity is a function of infrastructure, not spectrum, then the more people who are contributing infrastructure and the more flexible business models, then the, the better we are going to meet the demand of 100 or more times capacity. So I think there's an opportunity in there, whether it makes business sense or not, other people will really take the question. And to Bruce, they should agree with me. <laughs> Very good. Any other thoughts? Well, let me just make one, one comment that came up when the person was sort of talking about uh, carrier centric networks and things like that. Um, I think when you go to small cells, it still can be quite carrier centric. I think it also opens up some interesting models for entrepreneurs in the sense that somebody could go in and basically put in small cells in a building or money buildings and then basically sell that capacity off to basically run virtual networks. And so I think these are tremendous opportunities out there uh, you know, for, for more innovation of, of business nature. 30 seconds. Okay. Yeah. I think in addition to, it's almost like the cost of the base station doesn't become as important as the backhoe because uh, the backhoe becomes a dominant driver, driving factor. If you have an asset that allows you to deploy either a wireline backup or even a wireless backup, all of a sudden you have a different uh, uh, advantage that Good. So, yeah, uh, it, it's interesting. I, I, I think this model of uh, because there's a lot of these wireless companies now trying to figure out how to get an in building, and they're starting. You know, there's some companies that are, are spinning up as that's what they needed. One of my concerns is I, I have a friend who uh, did the same sort of thing in the, in the wireline space years ago, and, and of course the outcome was he got bought by a very large company, and it went from competition to <laughs> one or two players. <laughs> so is that, the, is that what's going to happen? You know, if, it, if it's, you know, what if it's uh, more of a uh, uh, ad hoc, you know, something that's more user based, which I think, I don't know what Matt might have been meaning, but uh, as opposed to a company that uh, provides, is, is, there a, is there an opportunity for this to be a, uh, a bottom up model of users, of users coming together to a federated model? access to their base stations. Good, so we're getting to the point of uh, wrapping up now, and so I'd like to um, ask the panelists to uh, share any final thoughts they have, I and mean, the kind of thing I'm quite interested in knowing, but that's what would make me rich if they told me this all the quiet, was, you know, what is cooking right now? I mean, one of the things that's, that's interesting thinking back 10 years is that, um, you know, the Ice Band Conference and a number of people here have been involved in just getting going. Um, and it took 10 years, but there were people in the community for whom dynamic spectrum access was like, oh yeah, you know, yeah, we've been doing that for a while, let's have a conference. So is there anything cooking right now that policymakers in DC should start thinking about? Uh, my sense is that we've heard a little bit about that today. I mean, I've been very interested by this notion of fusion, the sense that there is some sort of convergence um, it looks as if it's going to be technical before it's regulatory. Um, that may take further thoughts. But to I'll start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, okay. This time I've been given my direction here. Uh, I'll start on that end of the table with us. Milan, you know, you've thought a lot about this future or the future. Come from there. Yeah, yeah I think. Uh, I think first I had to admit that I'm wearing the hat of a researcher, uh, not a businessman or a person from a product division. So demonstrating technologies in the lab uh, and doing the technology innovation, I would almost say is the easy part and it maybe comes naturally to me. Uh, but I think transitioning this technology of sharing, uh, integrating that in a cellular world or a new type of wireless network, <coughs> whether the notion of license is diminishing, but the notion of capacity creation is what is more dominant, right? Uh, how that evolution will happen, I think, squarely depends on business incentives uh, that need to be in place and investment incentives that need, need to be in place. And I think one thing that's lacking is, uh, uh, compared to wireline board, where there's no real policy hurdle that you need to come up with because there's no primary incumbent uh, or there's no primary owner of a copper a fiber bundle, right? You can go and deploy your fiber bundle if you need to. But before you can do wireless, you need to have spectrum access. So, and the spectrum access is controlled by a regulatory authority. So that policy hurdle until that is removed, uh, this uncertainty that keeps swirling around 
what I can create in lab, whether it will appear in a real wireless network or not, and how soon it will appear, I think that's not going away. So in some sense, somebody referred to lack of leadership. I think it was Doug who mentioned. So that leadership at the policy level uh, is very, very critical, where rather than just focusing on a consensus-based approach of listening to people and coming up with a decision, somebody at the SSC needs to have a proactive, uh, maybe it's harder to do than uh, uh, I, I, I'm articulating it, but a bit more uh, um, on leadership at the policy uh, uh, authority level that we need to have, I, I would say. Good. Good, thank you. So, you know, Chris got from McCabe, I think people do 20 minutes, uh, 20 words at the beginning, so one minute each. <laughs> Policy makers shouldn't mistake what are their induced distortions from what are intrinsic in the technology, like the unlicensed versus licensed, is an argument that only came about because policymakers partitioned it. And they should be very willing to go back and not think about developing the two ecosystems, but to think about how we can take those ecosystems apart and let the market make them much more fungible. The technology can move things around now, and the regulation really has boxed them into little, little segments, and they're, and they're far from optimal. Yeah. I'm going to sort of stick to this classic. Licensed, unlicensed. Uh, well, because I think someone has to. Well, it's just, and I'm not doing this, but but one of the things that I heard earlier and, uh, is we, we need to make steps forward, okay? And if we spend all of our time arguing about possible new models and things like that, maybe we're going to get nowhere. So, but but the point is, um, you know, if, you know, on some of these things, it's totally different models. But what I was trying to say is that I think there's a need for both licensed and unlicensed operation, as well as some of these things that I was talking about as ASA operation moving forward. I think we just have to have to be clever in how it happens. Thanks. Thank you. Dale. Well, I'm a broken record here. I think all, all this depends upon steadily increasing uh, performance of receivers. And even, even with Preston's sort of model, you know, you can move around and say, you know, if the person has got a 10 megahertz channel and they're claiming 200 megahertz on either side, you know, it's still, been, even if you can avoid hitting them, you're still really encumbering an awful lot, awful lot of spectrum. So I know I'm a broken record, but we really do need to get our hands on, on the receiver problem, I think, to make, uh, if we're really going to get the, the kind of uh, uh, spectrum utilization if we need to accommodate the, the growth. Got the wrong way. Um, so if I put on my uh, uh, professor gown, back back in Colorado I build uh, radios and I measure how those radios perform. And I also play a lot with protocols. And it uh, when I when I uh, oh, turn yourself in. Uh, I want to come back to what I said before, which is I'm seeing so much of these technical innovations being incorporated at multiple levels into what we think of as licensed uh, services as well as unlicensed services, and I see a convergence here. And when I say that, what I see is that everyone's trying to get more and more efficient use out of the spectrum because they need it for all for the demand. And they're going to need the fiber, obviously, as, as uh, Richard pointed out um, on the back end. So I get the point that I want to make is that I don't think we can even predict what radio networks are going to look like 10 years from now. I'm sure there's going to be a heterogeneous. I'm sure it's going to be a lot of these things. But I think it's going to be much more coordinated even in the unlicensed bands than it is. I think that's what I mean. Wonderful. So thank you very much uh, for the panelists.